everybody. Um, welcome to coming to our webinar this, or thank you for coming to our webinar this afternoon. I'm Michelle Carter. I'm the Director of Programs and Services here at AGRIP. Um, and I have got, let's see, 158. Uh, so I'll leave this open for a couple minutes to see if anybody joins and then we'll get going with the introductory notes. Okay, looks like we've got a couple people jumping in here, so I'll just give it one more second. Okay, um, welcome again to today's webinar, State Sovereign Immunity and Tort Caps Overview. In this webinar, we'll get an update on sovereign immunity and tort caps across the nation and their potential impacts on public entity polling. Uh, I've got a few logistical announcements first we get, before we get to the presentation itself. Uh, all attendees are automatically muted, so to ask a question, please type it into the chat or question field on the webinar panel. Questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. Um, we also have a Sovereign Immunity and Tort Caps handout available during this webinar. To access it, you can use the handouts pane in the control panel of the webinar. Click the name of the file to begin automatic download, and then you can save the document to your computer. Um, a copy of the presentation slides themselves will be sent to participants after the webinar, and the webinar will also be recorded and available on demand for members on the Agrip website in the next week or so. Um, and I just want to give you a quick logistical heads up that we're going to have a quick transition in the middle of the webinar between presenters, um, so just you'll, you'll see that transition quickly. Um, and then to introduce the presenters, we're joined today by Gary Wickert, partner at Mathiasen Wickert and Lair, and Kirk Mylander, who's general counsel at CIS and Agrip member pool out in Oregon. Uh, Gary is regarded as one of the world's leading experts on insurance subrogation with 34 years of litigation experience and several books and legal treatises on the matter to his name. And Kirk has been with CIS as general counsel for several years, including coordinating a successful appeal of adverse verdict that had sought to strike down Oregon's tort cap. And with that, I'll turn it over to Gary and Kirk. Well, hi, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. My name is Gary Wickert. Um, some of you may know me, I, and I know I have some clients in the audience. I'm a partner with uh, Matisse and Wickert Lair. We're a Wisconsin subrogation firm which has offices in uh, California and New Orleans, and we do work for a number of insurance companies, um, self-insured entities, governmental entities, municipalities, counties, states. Uh, I know the city of Jacksonville, a good client of ours, has some people in the audience, some people, uh, some clients uh, who are in pools, some clients who are not in pools. And thank you to AGRIP for sponsoring this, this webinar. Um, this information is something that is sorely needed within the industry and uh, we just can't get enough education. Um, I'm excited to be speaking with Kirk Mylander, who I consider to be a true expert in the area of governmental immunity, pooling, caps. Uh, he's general counsel with, with CIS, so I feel honored to present with him and he'll present the last half. What I plan to do um, is from my perspective, and my perspective is that I'm a plaintiff's trial lawyer for the insurance industry and for self-insured entities and governmental entities, municipalities. Um, I'm engaged when um, governmental entities are looking to recover money back. I handle the subrogation side of things from work comp to health to property to auto, uh, fidelity, uh, you name it. And therefore we have an excellent, well-rounded perspective today as we talk about uh, state sovereign immunity and tort caps. Um, I am going to walk you through a short history of sovereign immunity. I want to take a look at the immunity from the 30, or 35,000 foot uh, view, an overview, if you will. And then we'll look at some other types of immunity which overlap with sovereign immunity for the public entity and how those forms of immunity play off and interact, interact with one another. Um, like, <clears throat> like many other areas of the law, could be work comp, health insurance, subrogation, tort reform, collateral source rules, damage caps. Governmental immunity and the ongoing saga of tort caps for governmental entities is and has always been a, a political struggle with businesses and state, county, local governments, uh, insurance companies on one side, and trial lawyers, employee unions, consumer protection groups on the other. And in the world of civil justice and tort law, 
this battle plays out in Congress. It plays out in state legislatures. It's, it plays out in legislative committees and courtrooms around the country. It's a struggle in which neither side rests and neither side calls for a timeout. But it is an important struggle because, as most of you know, and as, as myself and Kirk will underscore, um, it has uh, profound ramifications for uh, not just the operation of municipalities, counties, states, governmental entities, but, but the, the U.S. economy itself. And I, I, I think that all too often that's overlooked. So in this ongoing battle, the, the side which blinks first will lose. And we do not want to be that side. So what I do um, with all other areas of law when I give webinars is I like to talk a little bit about the history. Now, that may seem pedantic and it may seem unnecessary, but I think it's important to have a reminder of what it is that we're fighting for. Um, when you look back at history, the common law of sovereign immunity can be traced all the way back to the notion that kings made the laws. And therefore, everything the king, king did was was a okay it was it was legal and this doctrine was thought to pass through to the several states uh, of the original founding um, colonies and the states before the founding of this country and then when the constitution was drafted in 1787 article 3 was written and it raised questions about this principle by exposing states to suits from citizens of other states and foreign states and therefore, uh, in 1793, there was a U.S. Supreme Court which dealt precisely with this issue. It was Chisholm versus Georgia. And it abolished the doctrine of sovereign immunity with respect to states. So in 1793, sovereign immunity was, was abandoned. And several years later, in response to this, Congress finally proposed and three-fourths of the states ratified the 11th Amendment. Now, real quickly, 11th Amendment says the judicial power of the United States shall not be construed to extend to any suit in law or equity commenced or prosecuted against one of the United States by citizens of any other state or by citizens or subjects of any foreign state. So <clears throat> um, this reinstated the state's sovereign immunity, at least to the extent that Article 3 encroached upon it. So um, it, it was still undecided as to whether or not a state could be sued by its own citizens. And for a hundred years, states enjoyed protection from lawsuits. And the Supreme Court extended 11th Amendment protections to, to um, suits against a state by one of its citizens until 1890, in the case of Hans versus Lewis, uh, Louisiana rather. And um, from that point on, the doctrine began to weaken and the US Supreme Court ruled that sovereign immunity was not without exception and states could be sued for an unconstitutional act by the state. And in 1908, um, uh, that Supreme Court decision was rendered. And then in 1946, the federal government passed the Federal Tort Claims Act. And this waived sovereign immunity for itself with respect to torts. And soon thereafter, state legislatures began to enact their own stort, uh, state tort claims act. Um, <clears throat> Uh, a compromise doctrine was soon developed at common law whereby government officers could be held liable for negligent performance of ministerial duty, uh, functions. We're going to talk about this in a moment. Uh, ministerial functions are operational acts involving the carrying out of policy, but not for discretionary functions. Those involve uh, policy setting and decision making, and that was the, the demarcation that we had. So immunity from liability for discretionary acts developed as an extension of the immunity afforded to judicial officers and um, the definition and the types of functions of these two types of functions evolved over time and caused a great deal of confusion. Um, we, we generally speak about two different categories and even lawyers, and I, I'll even say especially lawyers because they deal in this get incredibly confused when it comes to, well, can I sue this city? Can I sue the state for this particular action, repairing a highway, delivering mail, what, whatever it might be? And uh, for many years, local government was liable only for proprietary acts and not governmental acts. And this rule attempted to distinguish between municipal activities, those which a municipality does by nature and those which merely supplant or parallel the workings of the private sector. So it made a vertical classification of activities um, in the sense that uh, broad spheres of um, uh, action so, such as education, police and fire, hospitals, garbage collection, maintenance of streets and sidewalks, sewage, 
all of that are, are, are they're labeled either, either governmental or proprietary. And once a service or action was classified as governmental, immunity applied on all levels. A decision to enact something protected as governmental. The actual negligent, in some cases, uh, fulfilling of that governmental action was also protected. So what you had early on was governmental acts, local government was not liable, they had immunity. If it was a proprietary act, i.e., the city, the state, the county is doing something that a private citizen can do, construction, et cetera, immunity was waived. Um, <clears throat> but that, for many years, that broader distinction of proprietary versus governmental uh, action was the simple but a very inadequate test. And over time, it became fused with uh, the narrower terminology of ministerial versus discretionary functions. So rather than local government automatically being immune from suit whenever a governmental act was involved, state law began to borrow the discretionary function rule, which originated with the Federal Tort Claims Act. So we inherited the, um, the, the more relevant and current distinction of discretionary versus ministerial, with discretionary immunity being what I'm going to talk about today. And, and so... This is sort of our history lesson here uh, to give us a background. And, and, and um, the important thing to remember is that we've had immunity and we've lost immunity. As Kirk will talk about later, we've had caps. Caps have been changed and they are being changed for political and incendiary reasons. And all of it affects the way we operate our governmental entities. Um, and as a result, it's important to remember that if we've had it once, we can lose it. So it, it, this is worth protecting. And um, so currently, uh, really only discretion and judgment at the highest levels, um, in general, only discretion and judgment at the highest level call for the imposition of governmental immunity. Um, governmental immunity being local government, cities, counties, towns, uh, because sovereign immunity is federal government and state government, and then the state bestows on the municipal, the municipalities and the towns and the villages, et cetera, um, their immunity. So it's more governmental. It's not sovereign because the, the city isn't sovereign. The state and the federal government is. So, um, but what what's important to remember, as I now will get into with the next slide on how we use this this discretionary immunity that we have. It's a tool. And remember that immunity is the first line of defense. Are you immune? Yes, game over. Are you immune? No. Now Kirk comes into play and we're gonna talk about caps because it's our second line of defense. Both are equally important. Uh, many of you may remember, I think it was in the early 2000s, the movie um, Pirates of the Caribbean, The Curse of the Black Pearl and the scene where Hector Barbosa and the crew of the Black Pearl are in a cavern and they're trying to reverse the curse when Elizabeth invokes the right of parlay and notes that according to the pirate code now, she has to be taken to the captain. And Barbarossa reluctantly agrees, but later reneges on the promise and he says, well, the code is more what you'd call guidelines and actual rules. The same thing can be said of sovereign immunity law. When you're looking at <clears throat> discretionary functions, uh, knowing how and when a tort action against a governmental entity can be pursued, including the pursuit of subrogation claims, which is my specialty and I do on behalf of many of you in the audience, that's indispensable for today's claims professionals and indispensable for, for today's pool members and um, um, governmental employees. So as with the pirate code, the rules we're given are more like guidelines than actual rules. And the states have developed three basic approaches or, uh, for interpretation. Um, first of all, in, uh, we have State Tort Claims Act, which are modeled after the FTCA. Um, and the doctrine of sovereign immunity varies from state to state, but it's usually in the statutory framework, such as a Tort Claims Act. Um, but it, it can be in a State Claims Act as opposed to a Tort Claims Act. Um, tort Claims Acts are, are a little bit different, um, but by and large, most states call for discretionary function exceptions to state liability, or a state can say, well, we can be sued, and here's exceptions, or we can't be sued, uh, and here's some exceptions. 
and that's every state does it a little bit differently. Now, the chart that is given to you as a handout, um, I, there's a there's a great danger in charts because everybody likes to be able to have at their fingertips the answer to everything. A chart is not the answer to everything, but this particular chart is um, it's a starting point. And it is a starting point for state sovereign immunity. I will mention that on our website, which uh, many of us, uh, many of you, including our clients, know has a, a number of resources. We also have a municipal, county, and local government immunity and tort liability in all 50 states chart. So the law is different, as you know, and the guidelines, the notices, the caps, uh, you know, things are different. So you can look look to that as well. So um, discretionary immunity is is what we're going to be talking about. Um, uh, sometimes the acts, the state acts, call for a special court of claims, a board or a commission to determine claims, and they often limit damages or provide for certain exceptions. Kentucky, uh, Connecticut, Illinois, Kentucky, North Carolina, and Ohio use this approach. But there are some different types of immunity that we need to, um, we need to talk about. For example, a city might have discretionary immunity they might not, but they might also have uh, other types of immunity. One such uh, immunity would be recreational immunity. Um, whether there is compensation and how much um, compensation can be awarded arising from a premises liability lawsuit against a governmental entity depends on the state or local municipality's recreational use statute. Uh, a recreational use statute is a law that has been passed intended to promote public use of parks and privately owned land, recreational land. And uh, all states have a, a recreational use statute that immunizes landowners from liability. I know Kirk um, is, is particularly involved in o Oregon, which has their own issue. And I'll mention that in a second, they've had a, a, a on again off again relationship with their recreational immunity statute and how it's interpreted but a recreational immunity statute generally provides that a landowner i.e city state uh, does not owe to a duty to someone using his or her property for recreational use and without charge they don't owe a duty to keep the property safe for entry or use and they don't owe a duty to give any warning of a dangerous condition use structure or activity on that property. This can be a very powerful recreational use statute. In, in Wisconsin, where I practice, and I've also been licensed on in Texas for 20 years, they have, a, they have a very strong recreational use statute up here in Wisconsin. So this statute usually provides that a, a landowner does not um, uh, extend to a, it, the, the immunity does not extend to a recreational user um, um, there's no assurance given to the recreational user that the property is safe, and there's no uh, conferring on a recreational user the legal status of an invitee or licensee to whom a duty is owed. So um, statutory immunity from common law liability does not apply, however, to willful or malicious actions, a willful or malicious failure to guard or warn against a dangerous condition. Let's say you have a piece of equipment on a playground or a, uh, a park and, and you know it's dangerous, people have been hurt before, you put it on your list of things to do and it just isn't gotten to. Well, there can be an exception then because some creative trial lawyer or maybe one who's not so creative will argue that it was willful or malicious. And we know they'll argue that about just about anything. Um, and statutory immunity doesn't apply to injuries suffered where the landowner charges people a fee who use the land for recreational purposes. So that that's um, important. And I, I, I mentioned the Wisconsin statute, which is uh, section 895.52. Um, this was passed because um, Wisconsin was very unhappy with, with the number of lawsuits that were being brought and under this statute, property owners are relieved of the duty to keep the property safe, the duty to inspect the property, the duty to warn, and the statute has two express exceptions. Uh, much like we said generally, if you charge a fee or if there's an intentional and malicious, 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 malicious act. Going to uh, Kirk's home state of Oregon, um, section 105.682, 
is a very similar recreational immunity statute that protects an owner of land, read city, state, county, from any contract or tort claim brought by an individual who is either injured or, or dies, is killed while on the land for any recreational purpose. I think the statute mentions gardening and wood cutting and some other stuff too. Um, whether the individual has a direct or indirect permission to be on the property. So it's a rather broad statute. As a result, in 2016, the Oregon Supreme Court decided the case of Johnson versus Gibson. In that case, there was a legally blind jogger who was injured in a state park when he stepped in a hole that had been dug by Gibson, a park technician. So Johnson sued Gibson. Uh, the, the blind jogger sued Gibson and, and uh, Stilson, the maintenance supervisor, for all the parks in the city. And the city of Portland tried to substitute, substitute itself as the sole defendant in the case, but wasn't allowed. So through some strained reasoning, the Oregon Supreme Court reached the conclusion that the statute exclusively protects those who hold legal title to the land and those who stand instead uh, of the landowners, such as tenants. But they found that the statute provides no protection to employees and non-employee agents. So, well, a lot of good that does, because now we can just sue the uh, the employee and the city will have to indemnify the employee. So the Oregon legislature raced to the rescue and passed Senate Bill 327, which changed the definition of the statute to include an officer, employee, volunteer, or agent acting within the scope of his, his, his duties. And this past June, uh, the governor of Oregon signed that into law. So um, you now have situations where a governmental entity may have um, discretionary immunity and now it also has recreational immunity so we're building up our arsenal of frontline defenses because we never want to get Kirk involved we don't want to have to deal with okay what are the caps how are they interpreted is somebody going to go lobby the legislature to increase the caps because everybody's upset that someone got seriously hurt and there wasn't enough money um, those are the things that, that uh, Kirk has a very interesting perspective on, and we'll talk about in just a minute. But uh, now we've got two arrows in our quiver. Let's talk about a third arrow in our quiver. <clears throat> um, cities, counties, states have employees. Last time I checked, uh, there's a lot of them in the audience today. Those employees are just like any private sector employee. They're covered by workers' compensation, and uh, as a pro as a all 50 states have workers' compensation statutes, and those statutes provide that an employer is immune from being sued um, while in, for, for injuries, death, while an employee is in the course and scope of employment. And, um, but it has some exceptions. There's exception resulting from an intentional act. Kentucky is a good example where you, you have to have deliberate intention and you know it, it, lawyers are, are always lawyers and you know you can say oh well was an act an intentional well it's intentional for me to swing around in a in a crowded elevator with my fist extended and my eyes closed does that mean i was intentionally spinning but only negligently did i strike somebody or was i reasonably sure that by spinning around and i'm six foot seven so i've got quite a wingspan reasonably sure that I'm going to hit somebody. So lawyers began to parse what intentional meant. And Kentucky is one of those states that put their foot down. No, a deliberate intention to cause the injury, which was, which was harm. So that's an exception. Another exception, let's say a city employee <clears throat> is injured while uh, pouring, uh, filling potholes and then goes to the, the city hospital and, and they uh, amputate his wrong, the wrong leg or, or overtreat him with opioids or, or somehow commit medical negligence in the treatment of that work-related injury. Now you have an employer wearing two hats. Number one, they're the employer of the pothole filler. And number two, they're the employer of the doctor who provided health care to the injured employee. And many states, not all, but many states, and there is a chart on this on our website as well, but many states say that, okay, that city is now acting in dual capacity. One hat they're wearing is an employer. Another hat is the health care provider. And obviously, the same holds true for the state. Um, so some states have no intentional act exception. Believe it or not, there are states that, that uh, and I have a long history of, uh, of workers' compensation. I could give you two. 
going back to uh, the Otto von Bismarck and, and what work comp stands for. But suffice it to say that some states believe strongly that the the deal we cut with employers in this country, whether it's the city of Houston or uh, the state of Alabama or Joe's Pet Shop, the deal we cut was that if an employer has workers' compensation and an employee is injured in the course of uh, scope of employment, that employer remains immune from suit, period. And some states take it to the, to the extreme, even if the act was intentional. So it's good to know when you have access to that exclusive remedy, remedy uh, immunity. And of course, lawyers being lawyers, we're going to argue, well, what was intentional? What was the injury intended? Was the action intended? And all of these things have to be litigated, taken up on appeal so we can have some sort of precedent. So exclusive remedy um, now gives us our third arrow in the quiver. We have our discretionary act immunity, recreational use immunity, exclusive remedy immunity, and like uh, like any two or three part inert compounds or chemicals, if you can mix them together, they can lead to explosive reactions and interesting legal issues. Let me give you an example. In Alaska, <clears throat> there's a little bit older Supreme Court case, but uh, a gentleman named Fenner was working for the city of Anchorage, and he was hurt when there, when his snowplow struck a protruding manhole, um, he received work comp and then proceeded to sue the city, alleging a quote unquote intentional tort. Okay, what does that mean? They intentionally left the manhole protruding. They intentionally tried to injure Mr. Fenner. Um, uh, part of this decision um, was that the Supreme Court declined to accept the substantial certainty test in determining the employer's intent to injure the employee. So the city argued exclusive remedy of work comp, and they argued about substantial certainty, and the court ruled that there was no specific intent to injure the employee. Okay, cool, that's great. They happened to win on that point. The court also drew another arrow out of its quiver and argued discretionary immunity because this was a discretionary act, and the court ruled that Fenner had failed to preserve the claim against the city. Well, luckily, they didn't need to use that because they had won, uh, you know, on an exclusive remedy. But this is an example of overlapping immunities and how we should be um, very careful and mindful that we have multiple arrows in our quiver. Another example uh, is from 2009. This is a New Jersey uh, Superior Court case in which a bus driver was in a head-on crash and suffered spinal injuries. Um, it really was his fault, and he was disciplined for driving and uh, also for the condition of his bus after um, ships. Well, the driver believed he was being singled out for some reason, and so he decided to sue. He sued the transit authority for an intentional affliction of emotional distress and also a hostile work environment. Intentional being the, the key term there. That's, that's the name of that particular cause of action. The claim was dismissed for failure to give timely notice. Um, of 90 days, and on appeal, the court held that the intentional tort exception was not subject to the notice requirement. So it's interesting that here um, they're they're melding or conflating two different immunities, and they're saying, okay, the intentional tort exception does not require the notice requirement uh, required in order to get um, uh, the 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 other immunities. So, and this, but this loss occurred prior to another case which came out in 2000, um, uh, another case which came out later, uh, in, actually in 2004, um, notice, notice the 10 year gap from the date of the accident to the decision from the Superior Court. Well, inter, in, in between there was another case that said that notice provisions of the Tort Claims Act do apply to intentional and negligent conduct. So, um, in Ohio, uh, another example of the multiple arrows in our quiver, we had a school custodian who died after falling from a ladder, pretty seriously injured, and the wife sued the Board of Education claiming a quote-unquote intentional tort, of course. Uh, and, you, you know, what's funny here is that if the law requires intent, attorneys will argue intent. As Kirk gets into the changing evolution of tort caps, 
I think we all know from experience that um, when the caps are enlarged, the claims are enlarged, the demands are enlarged. So it just fills the void and it's an endless void. Um, but in this case, in New Jersey, if there's an intentional tort, the parties are no longer in the employer-employee relationship. They've just decided that in New Jersey, okay? If you intentionally um, hurt an employee, there's no longer an employee-employer relationship, so you just skirt the exclusive remedy immunity. It goes away. But the plaintiff also claimed the exception to municipal immunity uh, of any matter that arises out of the employment relationship creating a dangerous condition. That was his cause of action that he pled. Well, guess what? The court ruled that the plaintiff could not claim an employment exception because it was intentional. And because it was intentional, it no longer arises out of the employment relationship. So it was not an employer-employee relationship. Um, and, and you can see how convoluted this gets, but how, how important it is for us to use all the arrows in our quiver. Lastly, um, <clears throat> we have a case out of Wyoming in which a county employee was injured while operating a front end loader. And apparently he wasn't very good at it, and he got hurt. And uh, he sued a coal employee who was there supervising the loader operation. He alleged that the loader was unsafe. He alleged that the employer took no action to make it safe. And in Wyoming, under the compact, unlike many other states, an employee can sue a co-employee. The court held that the Governmental Claims Act did not waive immunity against a supervising co-employee um, because of the action that he was engaged in at the time. He was supervising the front end loader. But note that if that co-employee had been operating a motor vehicle, immunity would have been waived. So these are just some examples, and we, we don't have a lot of time this morning, an hour isn't really a lot of time to cover this mammoth subject. Um, but this gives you an overview of how important um, this, this sort of stuff is. Um, and as, as I'm getting ready now to, um, to introduce Kirk and, and his subject, I, I, uh, this, not only are immunities overlapping, but immunities and tort caps overlap. And it's important to understand the practical effects of, um, of uh, tort caps. And I'll give you an example that happened this week. Um, we were involved in a, um, a large um, uh, mediation involving uh, a work comp claim in, in, in a particular state. I'm not gonna mention it because it's still ongoing. We had a pizza delivery employee who was struck by a shoplifting suspect involved in a police chase. And this chase was initiated by the local municipal police department. Now the employee became a quad. And it's a very sad story, a young kid delivering a pizza, minding his own business, saving money for college, now has to spend the rest of his life in bed. Um, well, the state combined risk pool insures the city in that case, and there's caps of 200 per occurrence and 750 per aggregate. Um, <clears throat> the attorney that uh, is working on the case and myself uh, noodled over this, and the third party case involves an alleged lack of unclear policies and procedures, failure to follow the procedures on the part of the city with regard to uh, you know uh, a, a pursuit, um, high speed pursuit, and 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 cities differ on this. In Milwaukee here, we don't have pursuits, so criminals here just drive fast to another city where some other the city police officer pulls them over and arrests them and sends them back here. Uh, but in this particular city, uh, they could have a high-speed uh, pursuit. Unfortunately, the pool offered 300 to the injured employee, 300 to the wife for loss of consortium, and 50 to each of the three children, totaling 750. Um, this is not enough money, and the politics began to enter the picture. Now, the reason I mention this as an introduction to Kirk Kirk's um, talk about the uh, development of, of CAPS and is because even for me, and in this particular case, I represented a city with, I represented a work comp carrier rather for the pizza delivery employee, um, trying to get back a massive amount of money, which has already been spent and will be spent over the course of this young man's life. But the reality of tort CAPS and the politics, the incendiary politics which accompany it has led to something rather strange. The pool offered this money, despite the fact that, um, you know, we, we haven't necessarily proven our case yet, 
But they also voluntarily revealed a $1 million per occurrence liability policy for catastrophic medical and offered the limits to us. Uh, we have in excess of a million dollar lien. Now, why would they do that? Well, this is where I'm going to introduce Kirk because why reveal a $1 million policy? Why offer it to the carrier? Is it the politics? Is it the poor optics? Is it the threat that the legislature would be um, asked to raise the limits, which would complicate claims uh, for an eternity? Um, so it's it's very it's fascinating the way um, Kirk's topic melds into my topic and what I do for a living. So with that, uh, I'd like to introduce Kirk. Kirk. Thank you, Gary. Good day, everyone. Uh, it is interesting the way the two cases, topics, intermeld, as you mentioned. Um, just to restate, uh, I'm Kirk Mylander. I'm at CIS. I'm the general counsel out here in Oregon. And we have um, had a, an ongoing issue with um, uh, challenges to our tort caps. And the, the reason that we're concerned and you all should be concerned about challenges to tort caps is that just a rumor of them uh, brings plaintiff attorneys, uh, they actuaries get concerned. They've called us when we've had challenges. We've had reinsurers express concern, even express concern after hearing one of my presentations um, about tort caps. And the um, playing field is changed when tort caps are changed. So there's a trend uh, nationwide of challenges to tort caps. Here in Oregon, there's a line of cases, and I'm going to talk about uh, two of the stories that make up those cases today. In North Dakota, they're facing a tort cap challenge, and it resulted from a medical malpractice verdict of three and a half million against a $500,000 cap on non-economic damages. In that case, a negligent biopsy caused the stroke in the patient. Uh, Utah is facing a prospective challenge to its tort caps, and they have um, talked with us about strategies in repelling that challenge. Oklahoma, their uh, newspaper did a story on caps with the plaintiff, uh, plaintiff's firm, prominent one there, saying, is it time to raise the tort caps? And that occurs uh, fairly frequently where plaintiffs bring it up, and that's exactly what we don't want, is plaintiffs bringing it up. Um, and then Maryland raised its caps in 2015. So here's a, a graph um, that shows the kind of the current layout of tort caps in uh, the country. And hang on one sec, I need to do something to make sure that my screen shows. I'm sorry for the um for the difficulty here. Um, I'm on the slide with the round graph. Yes. Thank you, Michelle, our uh, crack person. Crack as in on top of it, Cracker Jack. So, um, <laughs> Kirk, that's how we work get started. <laughs> so, here's our slide that shows the overview of the states with tort caps. Uh, we have 36 states who have a cap on liability for government entities and 15 with no caps. You'll notice that that adds up to 51, not 50. That's because DC has no caps. 
So moving on to the next slide. Really what we want is to make sure that the debate is framed uh, by us, by government entities, and is not framed by uh, plaintiffs and plaintiffs' counsel who um, want it to be more about who pays and how much. Uh, we want the tort caps to um, be able to provide stable funding for essential programs over time. Next slide. So what plaintiffs want to do is talk about how do we make uh, every person whole versus who pays. You know, that's not what we want. We want to have a discussion that's about the benefits of CAPS, uh, serving the government, serving programs, serving people, steady services at a predictable cost. Next slide. So the stories that I'm going to tell, there's two, and the first one is uh, Johnson versus Gibson, case number one. Next up. And it's a story of a three-month-old baby, and uh, let me tell you that babies make for bad opponents when it comes to tort cap debates. And this three-month-old baby suffered a brain injury during heart surgery. And what happened was the heart surgery itself was successful. Uh, and it, it occurred at Oregon Health Sciences University, or OHSU, which is a state hospital here in Oregon, research hospital that is itself subject to the tort caps because it's a division of the state. And in that case, uh, after the successful surgery, the baby then did not have um, oxygen coming to it. Someone turned it off when the surgery was over and the baby suffered uh, profound brain damage. The parents sought $17 million for a lifetime of care because uh, the child was going to live, have a normal life expectancy, but basically be in a vegetative state. And no one disputed that that was going to be uh, extremely expensive. The caps at that time uh, were 100,000 for uh, personal injury, 100,000 for uh, non-economic damages. And in, or in Oregon, the the person whom um, the employee, so in this case, the doctor who committed the negligent act, uh, they could be substituted out and the government entity here, OHSU, would be the only defendant. And so OHSU did that and then said, okay, um, you know, we're subject to a $200,000 cap, so parents, Clarks will just write you a check for 200,000 and the case is over, um, you know, and, and that's that. And the parents and their counsel said, hey, $200,000 compared to what we need to take care of this kid for the rest of their life is not even a drop in the bucket. It's, it's no remedy at all. And uh, that was their argument to the uh, Oregon Supreme Court that such a tiny fraction of what they needed violated the remedy clause of the Oregon Constitution. And it, was, it wasn't it was even a drop in the bucket. It was no remedy at all. And it was a compelling argument. Uh, now, the tort cap had been in place. Uh, this was about 2004 that this happened. The tort cap had been in place since the late 80s at that time. So they were pretty stale. Next slide. So the result of that case was the Supreme Court said that the plaintiffs can sue individuals, so in this case, the individual doctor, without the cap applying, if the capped recovery would, amount, uh, would not amount to an adequate 
recovery. So in other words, the government, the hospital, still indemnifies itself and the doctor, in this case, or the government employee. And because the recovery against the government only was inadequate, they can then sue the doctor. And that the individual with the no cap applied to them. So it was effectively an end run around the caps. They can recover a capped amount from the government entity and an uncapped amount from the government employee. And who pays when a government employee gets sued for what they do in the course and scope of their employment? Uh, yeah, the government, of course. So uh, the government pays the uncapped amount. Now, one thing that was interesting in this case is two justices on the Supreme Court, they concurred with the result but they, in their concurrence, they basically, it was their concurrence was basically a letter to our legislature saying, please, we plead with you to raise the tort caps because a less disproportionate limit might be constitutional. But there's just the disproportionateness of 200,000 to 17 million is just too great that that violates the remedy clause. But a higher limit, it may not violate it. Next slide. So the rule was that um, we needed to provide an adequate, uh, but hopefully not unfettered remedy to plaintiffs. And what happened was the state and OHSU uh, got together with plaintiff's attorneys, uh, the state chapter of plaintiff's attorneys, and they negotiated a set of caps that local government felt was uh, much too high. And so local government said, hey, you know, we should have lower limits for us. And we came up with a two tiered set of caps for personal injury claims. And so one tier applies to the state and to OHSU because you know, local government's not conducting surgeries. And then, um, one set that applies to both for property claims. Then what was key was the new caps include an escalator clause that ratchets up, ratcheted up every year for five years. And now it increases every year based on the consumer price index. Next slide. So previously, the cap was uh, 50,000 for property damage and 100 for economic and non-economic. Now it's adjusted every year and it's at um, 116 for state and for property and then um, local personal, personal injury and death are at about 700. The 1.4 million is the aggregate. Uh, the state and OHSU, they're at 2.1 million per claim and four and a quarter million for aggregate. Next slide. Case number two, you know, we had this new structure in place and we thought that it would hold and it had escalator clauses and it should be all good. Uh, then case number two rolled around, uh, next slide. And that one is the one that Gary referred to in, um, made mention of Horton versus OHSU. And this featured another sympathetic plaintiff. Again, we've got a baby boy that's having surgery at OHSU. So uh, just not a set of facts that we wanna have a, be the basis of a tort cap fight. In this one, uh, the baby had cancer on his liver and while the doctor um, was trying to remove that, he cut the blood supply to the child's liver and that necessitated a transplant, which necessitated flying the baby down to Stanford and having multiple surgeries um, back and forth between the two hospitals seven surgeries over three weeks, and the result was $5 million in medical bills. The case went to trial. 
the verdict was uh, about $12 million. And the tort cap at that point for OHSU was at $3 million. So OHSU had paid the $3 million long before it went to trial, and the uh, family of Tyron Horton said that, you know, that's just not adequate. $3 million is not enough, and uh, they went to trial to prove however much they wanted and got this $12 million verdict. Um, interestingly enough, uh, the, the mother, who was kind of the driving force behind the lawsuit, said she didn't un, uh, object to caps on damages for pain and suffering, but objected to uh, caps on hospital bills because the family would be stuck with that. Uh, incidentally, I know from knowing risk managers at OHSU that all her hospital bills are forgiven and she isn't going to have to pay anything more to doctors. OHSU and Stanford worked it out between them. The uh, boy, himself is at this point is seven years old. He's doing well. He lives a normal day-to-day -day life. So long-term, uh, medically, this one is a success, but the legal fight uh, went on. Next slide. So OHSU paid three million for its capped amount. That applies uh, toward the total judgment of 12, leaving $9 million still in dispute. Next slide. So the court entered judgment for the full 12 million. This is the trial court. And uh, that was kind of sad to me. The judge in this case used to sit uh, two doors down from me at the firm that I uh, came from before I joined CIS. The, um, it didn't li limit the judgment to the cap. So of course, OHSU appealed and argued that the cap that the legislature had carefully considered it should be uh, it should apply in this case and that setting caps is the legislature's role not the court's role and of course uh, we agree with that horton's attorneys argued that the legislature cannot interfere interfere with uh, a plaintiff's right to a jury trial and that includes uh, changing in any way the plaintiff's um, the verdict that a, a, a jury sets out. So it, a judge, in their view, should not be able to reduce uh, a jury verdict, should not be able to set aside a jury verdict, um, should do nothing but bow down and worship a jury verdict because they are the songs of angels and judges should not breathe on them. Next slide. So with this case going to the Oregon Supreme Court, we have uh, three possible outcomes. If we could get the next slide. They are um, reestablish a hard cap for all circumstances, and that is what OHSU wanted. Uh, they wanted no more of this uh, flexible cap where uh, someone can sue an individual employee if the difference between the capped amount and the jury verdict is too great. Uh, they wanted a hard cap for all circumstances. Uh, the second possible result was maintaining this flexible cap where um, someone can sue an individual if their damages are huge, way more than the cap. And then the final result that we feared was that the court would strike down all caps and all this work and the deal that we got done at the legislature would just be set aside and there would then be um, 16 or 17 uncapped jurisdictions in the US rather than the current 16. Next slide. So what happened was that OHSU, they appealed to the uh, state of Oregon or to the Oregon Supreme Court uh, on the merits, and then we coordinated with them to file an amicus brief, and we tried to really focus on showing the Supreme Court what the practical effects were of losing our tort caps, you know, and what the benefits are of having our tort caps. So, in in doing that, we uh, pooled together, as it were, we 
developed allies with some other pools here in the state of Oregon, our special districts pool and our school pool, uh, our large public universities, they have actually a small uh, pool and they joined us as well in jointly filing an amicus brief. And then we found, uh, we had some support with self-insured cities and counties. There are a few in Oregon that are large and self-insured. And of course, they're interested in, in maintaining the caps as well. Next slide. And what we wanted to uh, feature is, you know, what would happen to the uncapped, in an uncapped environment and paint a pretty stark picture for the Supreme Court that would get their attention. Next slide. So um, we wanted the legislature to, uh, we wanted the court to understand that it's the legislature who it should be the one who weighs the cost of providing plaintiffs with unfettered remedies versus the cost of providing stable tax rates and stable services through uh, state and local government to the public. And it's the legislature that previously had reset the cap and the court should not take on the legislature's work and then do a second reset of the cap via this court case. So that was kind of the heart of our argument. Next slide. So what we did is we put together some data by um, surveying cities in an uncapped state close to us, Washington state, compared that with uh, cities of a similar population in Oregon where we do have caps. So you can see here um, in Oregon, the county, we did cities and counties. The county of Coos has a very similar population to Walla Walla um, with a similar deductible, but Coos County has a liability premium of uh, about $138,000, while Walla Walla's is $370, or getting close to triple uh, the number, the amount every year. Uh, Polk County has a similar population to Chelan, and its population or its premium is 111,000, while Chelan pays 505,000. So, you know close to five times the difference. Next slide. And then for cities, uh, Fairview, Oregon actually has a slightly larger population, almost identical to Snohomish, Washington, but Fairview pays uh, one fourth the amount in liability that Snohomish pays. And Junction City has a nearly identical population as Ocean Shores, Washington, but Junction City pays uh, under 50, while Ocean Shores pays over 100, 110. So, um, you know, from double to five times the difference is what we see when comparing uh, cities' premiums in an uncapped versus a capped environment. And that has a real effect on services. Next slide. So, what we um, then put together was, okay, let's say that all of our cities, special districts, schools are gonna be paying these increased liability premiums. What is that gonna do to budgets? So uh, we showed that if we lost our tort caps, the impact on budgets would be an amount equal to, not 227 to 487 teaching positions. We were careful to say an amount equal to. It's not like we were arguing that 220 teachers would lose their jobs. It could happen, but it'd be an amount equal to that. Uh, because frankly, you know, we wanted to, to get the court's attention and get the attention of people who read the amicus briefs. Next slide. So with um, city and county employees, it would be an amount equal to 1,300 to 2,800 full-time city or county workers. Next slide. For special districts, it'd be 140 roughly to 270 special district employees. Next slide. And for universities, uh, the last member of our amicus group 
it would be an amount equal to 830 to 1700 full-time students tuition and fees which is you know, nothing to sneeze at next slide and the plaintiffs actually responded directly in their brief to our amicus brief and I, there's a lot of writing here but I'll, I'll summarize it the the plaintiffs basically said hey all this stuff that the uh, amici are briefing you on about the the way that losing tort caps will devastate budgets uh, and this is the plaintiff saying this they say that that really shouldn't be considered in court that's uh, appropriate for the legislature to uh, look at all these different facts and weigh outcomes and decide on levels of services and it's beyond the scope of a court to test the validity of data weigh options or preempt policy choices the legislature may make in the future and that's that's exactly our argument except for we were saying this court shouldn't uh, preempt the policy choices that our legislature already made the last time they reset the caps. Uh, they should keep their hands off. Um, the, the court in this case shouldn't reset the legislature's work on the tort caps. Next slide. So what happened? Here were our three possibilities and we had victory. Uh, the court held that the tort caps did not violate the plaintiff's right to a jury trial. They specifically said that the right to jury trial is procedural. It's not substantive. Uh, and that makes for a nice site if any of you guys are fighting that argument in your jurisdiction. They also said that uh, the right to a remedy was not violated, that the legislature can limit government liability as a partial waiver of sovereign immunity going all the way back to the beginning of uh, Gary's presentation and that um, then they also pointed out and this wasn't one of our arguments that the caps ensure that there's a solvent defendant at least one who will be able to pay the plaintiff something and that there's a value in that too to the plaintiff and then finally they overruled two of the underlying cases that the plaintiffs had relied on for uh, their jury trial argument and remedy clause argument. So our caps are now more stable than ever, which is something I always wanna point out to our reinsurers and actuaries, should you be on the phone listening to this. Next slide. So what are some warning signs that you should pay attention of? Just in summary here, uh, if your tort caps have not been revised since the 1980s, that is a sign that um, you should pay closer attention to what they're at and how stale they are as compared to um, you know, current personal injury valuations. If no one's having any conversations of any kind about the tort caps in your states, that's a warning sign as well. Or if you've got a high damage case injuring a highly sympathetic person, uh, that can set the context and the conversation can frame it up in a way that you don't want to have. So you want to raise the issue and frame it up outside of the context of a highly sympathetic plaintiff. And then a final warning sign is there are similar states around you um, who are facing their own tort cap challenges like we talked about at the very beginning. Next slide. So the final four points here, uh, keep your caps uh, updated. Uh, even if you have some that are in place and you don't wanna reset them, you could put in an escalator clause tied to the consumer price index so that they move gradually with inflation and that at least will make a good argument that they are, um, they're not stale. Uh, second, you know, share, share data amongst the other pools in your state. Uh, that's what we did and that really helped. We've also worked with pools from other states after we went through this and I'd be helpful to do that to anyone who's listening in um, if you wanna see uh, kind of under the hood on how we put together our amicus brief. Uh, third, you know, try to demonstrate in hard numbers how losing uh, caps and immunities too 
will result in unstable tax rates or, or unstable service levels. It's probably easier to prove unstable, unstable service levels. And then um, finally, emphasize that the, it's the legislature's role to weigh and frame um, whether how, how to weigh meaningful recovery versus the government's ability to provide necessary services at predict, predictable rates. And that's really the heart of what we're trying to do, uh, make sure our members are able to provide the services that they need to provide their citizens at rates that are affordable. Um, you know, essentially we can pass on the cost, but it's gonna come out of our members. They're the ones who really feel the pain. So this fight is largely for them. Uh, next slide. The last uh, bonus tip is never to pick a fight with a baby who's just had surgery. That's a place you don't wanna go, believe you me. And uh, with that, I'm at uh, the conclusion of my presentation. Um, I've been told by Michelle that we may have questions. And I assume she's gonna be coming on. Yes, here I am. Um, we have not had any um, questions come through. Um, we did get one comment, uh, Gary, that you get bonus points for your Pirates of the Caribbean reference at the beginning. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, we haven't had any questions come through. Um, and I'm recognizing that we've gone, that it's uh, 3.04. Um, so we've gone a little bit over and I'm sensitive Michelle? to people's schedules. Yes. Real quick, I, I did I did get it one question emailed to me directly. Okay. Awesome. Um, it it uh, Kirk was mentioning all the ramifications of of you know raising the caps. Um, there's a question here from it's actually a client who happens to be online. Uh, how does this affect the claims process um, for cities, and counties, and states? Um, and real real quickly, uh, instead of every once caps are raised, instead of every demand being three hundred thousand, if that's the cap, every demand would now be inflated, be inflated uh, to be much higher to, to meet, meet whatever the cap is and reserves under the GASB Statement 10 would go up on every claim. Um, the IBNR, the incurred but not reported claim development would be disrupted. The city's uh, general liability actuary would now have to bump up numbers and in a state, if you happen to be in a state with no income tax and serious limitations on ad valorem taxes, the entire system, not just the claims process, but the entire system is disrupted with the seemingly simple but sympathetic and caring act of raising caps and our job is to communicate that we're not we're not we don't have caps to be selfish because we don't care about the, the baby that kirk is talking about we, we we try to keep caps in place because they serve a valuable function and it's our job to make sure everybody understands that okay um and no other questions have come in um, while you were answering that emailed one. Um, and it it seems, I mean, Kirk, I, I think your message and Gary, your answer to the question there is that tort caps that are fair uh, to the, to in a plaintiff situation and workable are um, a good solution all around. And so if you haven't revisited your tort caps since the 80s, um, that hopefully the takeaway you get out of this is that it may be a good idea to start thinking about them. Um, with that, Kirk or Gary, do you have any closing comments? No, thank you for having us. Okay, hearing none, yeah, I've got you. no other questions. Thank you both for taking the time today and thank everyone for taking the time to join us. Um, the slides, a copy of the slide deck and a copy of the presentation recording will be available on the AGRIP website um, within the week. And if you have any questions, you can feel free to reach out to um, Kirk, Gary, or AGRIP directly. Thank you so much and have a good day. Bye.